Good morning and welcome to fellowship. This morning's call to worship is taken from our short celebration, excuse me, celebrational hymnal 742 from Philippians 4 6. Here are these words. Do not be anxious about anything but everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand as we join our voices together in our praise to God as we sing Glorious Day. Hopefully you've noticed a good morning to everyone this morning. We know that we'll be utilizing the hymnal today as well as another side sheet for some of the songs. So we'll be singing Glorious Day that's found in your separate sheet from kind of your order of service. And then from that, we'll be going to 790, We Gather Together. But first of all, as we think about freedom, we think about the freedom and love and grace that God has given us as we live our lives. It's a gift from God. We'll sing Glorious Day. could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shine among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, Very he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified Free me forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering and anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree, He took the nails from me, living He loved me, dying He saved me, bearing He carried my sins far away, rising He justified. Freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. We'll move to, we gather together, we'll sing verses 1 and 3 in your hymnal, page 790. We gather together. seated. Good morning. Happy Sunday. How are we doing this morning? 
good. You look good this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're at home. We are so thankful that you are here able to join us this morning. And happy 4th of July. Happy Independence Day. I hope everybody has plans of fireworks and hot dogs and hamburgers or however you're planning on celebrating our Independence Day. And so today, uh, we don't have actually as much going on as we have the past couple of weeks. We do have one announcement that next week is our VBS debrief. I said it was today. I was wrong. And so I got a little ahead of myself. But next week, we'll be meeting after uh, church to debrief about VBS, how it went and how we can continue to improve it for next, next year. Now, one of the important parts that we have during worship is that we have a time of prayer where we gather together and share our prayer requests, the things that are burdens, our stresses. We share those together, but we also want to celebrate together the things that God is doing and moving. Or as Sharon and I talked about this morning, those God winks uh, that we see that God is doing throughout the week and how we can share and encourage each other through those praises. So if you have a prayer request or praise, we'd love to hear it. And if you're at home, you can participate too. Just type it in and Patty will make sure that we hear about it here in service. So does anybody have any prayers or praises this morning? Sharon has one. Mercy South. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And that's your sister? Sister in law. So the two prayer requests, Denny's doing better. He's been weight-bearing for a bit. He goes back on the 11th. Did I hear that? Yep. And uh, also uh, just prayers for Sharon's sister-in-law, Pat, who's uh, down at Mercy South, and uh, that she's had a little bit of a struggle this week. So prayers for restoration. And thankful that the doctors figured out what was going on. So good. Joe. Okay. Mm. So Joe shared that he went back to work finally two weeks ago. It's been a long process, but you're there, and he has a good supervisor that's encouraging and building him up. That is really good. Amen to that, Julie. 60 years. Bob and Joanne, and what a blessing that is. That is definitely something to celebrate. 60 years and on Independence Day, or almost Independence Day nonetheless. That's good. Harry? Okay. Okay. Continued prayers for Harry's sister. She's had some heart issues, Rosemary, and uh, and so she's having surgery this Wednesday. Okay, for fluid building up and stuff. Jerry. So continues prayer for Gus. He's back. Um, at Friendship Village, so that's good that he's he's close to home, not quite back in his apartment yet, but just continued prayers for his uh, full, full recovery. So, Joe, did I see your hand up again? Which wedding anniversary? 40th wedding. Joe's brother is having his 40th wedding anniversary on July 4th. That was a busy day. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. 
I'm thankful my mom and dad are here. Mom's back. She's ready to run that marathon. And, uh, and so it's good to have her back in attendance. It's good. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's, let's take these prayers and praises before the Lord this morning. Father, as we have been reading in the book of Acts, it is so good to share uh, with one another our prayer requests, our concerns, and our praises. Father, you are the good king, the good ruler who created everything, the heavens and the earth. Father, I pray that you would be with each of us, whether we're here in person or whether we're at home. Father, we are all struggling with our own issues. Uh, Father, there's so many things that, that we have that you bless us with every day that we take for granted. And so there's, there's so many things that we, we could share, uh, but we don't. And so, Father, we just pray for those unspoken prayer requests, those that we've kept to ourselves. But, Father, I also pray that you help give us close attention to how you are engaging with us each and every day, those small things that you do that help us out that we don't even realize. And so, Father, I pray that you just give us an eye for those types of God winks, those, those blessings that you perform throughout every day that show us that you are here and that you are with us. Father, we pray for those that are struggling. Father, that those that are recovering, whether it's shoulder surgeries, whether it's uh, hospitalizations, whether it's uh, heart issues, Father, I pray that you would continue uh, to help give perseverance and strength and recovery. Father, we're so thankful for our doctors, our nurses, our first responders. Father, especially on, on weekends, long weekends like this, uh, we know that our, our first responders will be busy. So, Father, I pray that you would give them safety as they are out protecting us and caring for us. Father, we also pray uh, for those that are on vacation. Father, we're so thankful that you bless us with times to get away, to t times to refresh. And so, Father, those that were on vacation that are back or those that are going on vacation, Father, I pray that you would continue uh, to give rest and relaxation. Father, I pray that you would uh, be with us this morning. Father, that you bless this time that we have together. Father, that you would give us one heart and one mind to praise you and that you would bring unity uh, here at Redeemer and uh, everywhere we go. Father, we thank you for all of this and we pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Today we are continuing the Heidelberg Catechism, which is one of the statements of faith our church was founded. We are looking at the Lord's Day 37. Question 101. But may we swear an oath in God's name if we do it reverentially? Yes, when we Yes, when the government d demands it or when necessarily requires it in order to obtain, in order to maintain and promote truth and trustworthiness for God's glory and our neighbor's good. Such oaths are grounded in God's word and were rightly used by the people of God in the Old and in te New Testaments. Questions 102. May we also swear by saints or other creatures. A legitimate, no, answer no. A legitimate oath means calling upon God as the only one who knows my heart to witness my truthfulness and to punish me if I swear falsely. No creature is worthy of such honor. I'd ask you all, if you would, who could stand, please stand. You'll get a workout with your legs, but also with your hands. If you can turn to page 804, we're going to do the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We'll just do verses 3 and 4. And then following right after that, we'll do Amazing Love, which will be found in that side separate sheet that was with your worship service. So 
804 Battle Hymn of the Republic, just verses 3 and 4 only. forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be sweet, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my king. The God is marching on. Glory, glory, Amazing love. I don't know if I said you are my king, but it's the same thing. You are my king, in parentheses, amazing love. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven. Back to the top. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Good morning again. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Acts, or Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. 
Acts is the first book after the Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. So if you're visiting with us this morning in person or at home, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of a summary. The book of Acts is a story about the early church, about how God established his church, how it was born, so to speak. And if you weren't here with us last week, we learned that Peter and John were in a little bit of a snit, that that they had healed a man who had been lame for 40 years and was proclaiming that in the temple at Solomon's portico, or Solomon's porch, as I like to say. And then they got in trouble by the Sanhedrin. So last week we saw this trial that was put on by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the 70 uh, members of the Jewish court, the Jewish Supreme Court. The high priestly families gathered together to determine what was good and what wasn't, and they were determining what Peter and John were proclaiming, that Jesus had risen from the dead, wasn't good. Now, if you remember, for Peter and John, they didn't have any charges brought before them. They were just brought before the Sanhedrin, the same court that tried and convicted Jesus, the same place. So, Peter and John were in a little bit of trouble because whatever the Sanhedrin determined would have been their fate. But the problem was the Sanhedrin didn't have any charges to bring upon Peter and John. So they had to release them, much to their dismay. And so today we pick up that part of the story of what does Peter and John do whenever they've been or whenever they've been captured and held with no charges, and then they were intimidated. Now again, this, this time with the Sanhedrin was a typical shakedown. They questioned them, they intimidated them, and then they told them they could not proclaim Jesus. So the question we have to ask is, what would we do in that situation? What would we do if we were captured and then released? How would we handle the situation like that. And so here we get some insight of what Peter and John did. And we're again in Acts chapter 4. And we're going to be in verses 23 through 37. If you would follow along with me. It says this. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there are gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people, peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and whatever plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, They had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, stole the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
This is the word of the Lord in our hearing this morning. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Luke's account for Theophil- to Theophilus. And Father, I pray that it would spur our hearts this morning. I pray that it would spur our hearts to love you more deeply. Father, that you would bring more unity among your people. Father, that we would seek each other's common good. That we would take whatever is ours and give it back to you for your glory and for the well-being of others. Father, I pray that we would have this same heart as your believers in the early church. Father, that we would have the same boldness as they did. That we would pray for the same boldness as they had and they did. Father, I pray that you would do a mighty work in this place and that we each would be shaken this morning, whether we're here in person or at home. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there is a lot going on in this passage. It's a beautiful passage. And I look to this passage often because I want what they had. Isn't this a beautiful passage about unity, about faith, about trust, trust in God, trust in one another? And I have to say, I love that they're praying for boldness because I don't believe I would have the same boldness that Peter and John did. Now here, they were released after the shakedown, after this, this horrible trial that they had to stand and testify that all they were doing was sharing what they experienced. Remember last week whenever the Sanhedrin said, do not testify about the resurrection of Jesus, what did Peter respond? I can only share what I have experienced. These weren't thoughts. These weren't even beliefs. These were experiences, things they saw, heard, felt. That's what they were sharing. And so here, what did they do? Now, here again, the most powerful court in the Jewish community had told them not to share about Jesus. This was the beginning of the persecution. They didn't know what was necessarily coming before them or after this. But they could tell the same hearts, the same minds that convicted Jesus, that crucified Jesus. Were, they were standing before and they knew and they felt the same way that they did. Now, if this was me, I would have hightailed it out of there. Said, guys, let's pack up our stuff and head head somewhere else. Because that's a lot easier than dealing with any of this nonsense. But is that what Peter and John did? No. We find out in verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends. Now, depending on what translation you have, this isn't always friends. I like friends. That's great. I love my friends. But here, this is their people. Depending on your translation, it's translated, they went back to their people. Now, here in the Greek, in the Hellenistic culture, they didn't really have this idea of your people that we do today, that that they have here in Acts. Because typically when you're talking about your people, it was your family. Or maybe your countrymen. But here, this is a whole new category. This is a whole new group of people that are established not about their bloodline, but about their beliefs. And their people were the people of the early church that had their faith in Christ and what he was doing for them. And so they went back to their own people and they reported what happened to them by the chief priests and elders. Now, this was just a fact by fact detail of what happened because their people just like us today if we had friends that were detained unjustly we would be at their house saying what happened are you guys okay what is going to happen to us that's what i would do if my friends got detained and so they went back and they they were sharing what happened how they testified to jesus And here they were finding a commonality, a shared uh, experience of fear and trembling about what was going to come next. If this happened to Peter and John, if we're preaching and proclaiming Jesus, what we experienced, what was going to happen to me? This was a valid response. 
So we have to ask the question, if this would happen to us today, what would we do? What would our testimony be? Would we go back to our friends? Would we, would we stay and pray for the same prayer that Peter and John and the believers prayed? What do we do in times of suffering? And one of the beautiful things that, that we see here is what the early church did in a time of uncertainty and suffering. Now, whenever we typically go back to passages about suffering, we don't always think of Acts 4. But that's what's happening here, is that the early church is beginning the pangs of suffering, and we see what they did. Now, again, this is a historical lesson. This isn't an imperative. This isn't how we handle it. But it's good to see what other believers did in times of trouble. And here, in verse 24, we see what they did. It says that when they heard it, so they heard their report, and they lifted their voices together and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So here, they're in the midst of a power struggle, right? We have the Sanhedrin, the people who are supposed to be the representatives of God, that are getting ready, they're threatening them, that are telling them to stop uh, testifying about uh, Jesus and what he's done. So what do, they, what do they appeal to? To God's sovereignty. And they're doing this together. Now what I, what I love about this in studying God's word and kind of getting into the intricate details is you really get to see the words that the authors choose. And here... Here's an interesting word when it says they lifted their voices together. The Greek word for, for that phrase, that concept, lifting their voices together, is homo to madon. Okay? So that is a compound word, obviously multiple words mixed, made up together and smushed together to convey this concept of they lifted their voice together. They were of one heart, one mind, of one, one presence. And if you break it down, we see see several different things one we have the word the greek word homo which means same and then we break, break it down to thymos which is passion heat or wrath which is an interesting uh, description here but it's the passion that they had about how they were praying and the conviction they had as they were praying and then part of that even thymos is the word thio which is sacrifice So what we see is they had the same passion, the same sacrifice as they lifted their voice together of one heart and one mind. And what does that generate? This sacrifice, this passion, it brings unity. And that's the unity we are seeking for today. Of one heart, one mind that we see throughout this passage. I was talking... Uh, this week, and someone asked the question, do you think we'll ever have the same unity they had in the church? It was just a couple weeks ago that even Julie King in our prayer time said, I'd like to pray for our country because it is so divisive. And so we have to ask the question, why is it so divisive? And if you look online for any amount of time, everyone has their own opinions on why we're so divided as a country. And I've got my own opinions, and I would like to blame the back porch, right? Now, I know some of you have back porches, and it's okay. Some of you, it's, it's, it's your fault. Now, why is it the back porch? Well, as I understand it, there used to be a thing called the front porch that we used to all sit on in our front yard. Now, here in the city, I have to say I am blessed with a great front porch. It's covered. So on days like yesterday when it's rainy, I can sit out in the morning and have my cup of coffee. And what's great about my front, front porch, especially here in the city, I don't know about in the county where some of you guys live, but here in the city, a lot of people don't park in their garage because their garage is full of stuff. So they have to go in through the front door. So as I sit on my porch in the summer and spring and fall, not so much during the winter, but what happens is I engage with my neighbors whether it's Jacob or Kurt or Ron or Tina. And we actually do this thing that we talk to each other. 
We, we hear about what's going on in their lives. We see what's going on in their families. Now, what's sad is that during the winter months, we, we hibernate and we don't see each other. And so that first nice weekend of the spring, we all come back outside as we sit on our porches or we come back and we actually bump into each other because I know it's too difficult to go knock on a door and say, hey, how are things going? Because who would do that? But here in our front yards, in our front porches, we can actually engage one another. And we can see what's happening. The problem that we have generally is that we don't talk as much anymore with each other. Or if we do, we do it behind a keyboard and a screen. And it's so much easier to do that and yell at people and type angrily on a keyboard rather to engage each other. Back in the day, you weren't able to to share crazy stories or ideas without someone saying, are you serious? You really think that? Because we would say that out loud, and we would challenge ideas. Today we just find people who have the same opinion that, that we do, and we're like, hey, see, they believe the same thing we do. Now what happens whenever we have that? It creates disjointedness among the people that we see regularly, whether that's people in the congregation, whether that's in our families. Because we want to be right. We want our way instead of what's best for everybody. Again, what is the main purpose of the early church? As we just read, it's the sovereignty of God. What God wants, we do. And we'll hear about that even more in a second. And so what do we need to do if we want to be unified as a church? We need to come together and say, what is our main purpose? Worshiping God. That's what we're here. That's our purpose. Love God. Right? And then the second thing we do is we care for one another. And we serve one another. We make others more important than ourselves. And that's how we bring unity. If we can trust each other that that someone else has the best interest in mind, then yeah, I'm going to trust them. I'm going to give them my stuff because I know that they have my best interest at heart. That's why the early church was able to thrive, because they trusted each other, that they had each other's back, that they knew that they had the same common thread. So the answer to the question, are we ever going to have the same unity as we did before, as we see here, is only if we have the same purpose. If we come back and we kill ourselves, we put up our cross for, the, for God and for one another. And so that is only up to us to decide if we're willing to do that, to sacrifice our wants, our needs, our desires for God and for his community. Because what we see is as they pray, they they come to this idea of God's sovereignty. Sovereign Lord who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In essence, what all the believers are saying, God, I know these, these folks are scary, They killed our Savior, Jesus. We watched them do it. But I'm more afraid of you than I am of them. You made heavens and the earth. And what's fascinating here, again, I'm going to nerd out for a second. Because I like languages and I like God's word. And it's amazing how Luke does this. But the word here in the Greek for sovereign Lord is despotes which is the same word we use for despot, right? Which is a malicious ruler. Now, are they, are they calling God a malicious ruler here? No, that wasn't the com- connotation here. But should we fear God? Yes. Is God all-powerful? Yes. Is he in charge? Yes. And also what's interesting is that it's also related or derivative of the word doulos in the Greek, which is servant. So these two words are connected. We have master and we have servant. So here for Lord, what we're hearing is you are my master. Whatever you say say goes. I am submitting to you. You know better than I do. And they are all doing that and praying that together. That's a powerful prayer. They're relying on God's sovereignty. And they are all confessing that they are servants of God. And then they go in, in verse 25, which is actually them just citing Psalm chapter 2, which says, 
who throughout the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord's anointed. Verse 27, for truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So here in Psalm 2, typically this is a passage that is applied to Jesus. He is the anointed. But here, the early church are also putting themselves that they are in the same boat as Jesus. Their message is the same as Jesus. And so they're, they're coming together and saying, why, why does the Gentiles rage, the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers here together against the Lord and his united? What they are all saying is that we are in the same boat. We have the same experience. We have the same problem. This is also binding them together. That all of these rulers, all of these principalities, all of this power is against me. What is our only way out? God. What is our only hope? God. That's what's bringing them together. They're putting themselves in the same boat as David did whenever he wrote Psalm 2. He, they're putting themselves in the same boat as Jesus did. And, and here what we have to see is what is their prayer going to be? Are they going to pray for these, these, politi- these rulers, these politicians to get out of office? Are they going to pray for a change in their circumstances? Are they, are they going to uh, pray for a, a different airfare to get out of Dodge? What is their prayer going to be? Well, let's see. Verse 29. And now the Lord look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus... And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Wow! Did you see what they did, what they prayed for? It's not what I would have prayed for. I would have prayed, God, these, these religious elites, they are, not, they are not for you. They are not holy. You need to remove them and get them out of there. That's what my prayer would be, to just remove them, to change my circumstances, right? That's not their prayer. Their prayer is two things. One, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What were they just told not to do? Speak God's word. So they come back to God and say, God, we'd like to double down. Because if I was in their shoes, I would be afraid. I would say, okay, there's a lot of things. I can figure out a ways around this to talk about God, but maybe not talk, you know, about what Jesus did, that he rose from the grave. I can figure out ways around it, right? That's what typically I try to do, find the loophole. Right? That's not what they did. They said, God, grant your servants, right, that do loss, grant your servants the ability to stay bold and preach your word. That's a strong prayer. So that was the first thing, that they are going to go back out into the public and preach God's word, and then what else are they going to do? They are praying that God would continue to stretch out his hand and heal and signs and wonders performed through the name of the Holy Servant Jesus. So they would go out into public and continue God's work through restoration and healing. So we see the proclamation of God's word and works going forth into Jerusalem, all in Jesus' name. And they're not scared. Why? Because they are in the ho- they are together of one heart, one mind, proclaiming Jesus. Not only God's word, but also their experiences together. So they're able to go out and to do what happens. And what do we see happens in verse 31? So they prayed this all together. 
And then the place in which they were to get, gathered together was shaken. Could you imagine that we pray, we do our benediction, and all of a sudden we feel an earthquake? That would be powerful. Like, let's go out and do God's work. He's creating everything. He's got us. He's caring for us. Let's go out and carry out God's will and heal and bring restoration and invite people into our family. Could you imagine the power that was part of that? That people go, did you feel that earthquake? It's like you say amen and then boom, what just happened? And it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went out and they spoke the word of God with, with boldness. Now here... It says filled with the Holy Spirit. So does that mean they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit before? Is that what's happened? Like they, they, they lost the Holy Spirit and now they were refilled? Do they have to just go back and go back like to the soda machine and get a refill of the Holy Spirit? No, but sometimes we lose our boldness. My, uh, my professor of New Testament in my undergrad, uh, Dr. Rubel, would say that sometimes we spring a leak of the Holy Spirit. And so we're not as bold as we are, especially, you know, you're first saved and you can't get enough of the Bible and you want to read it all and you put it down and you reread it. And then later on you're like, where's my Bible? Let me dust, let me dust it off first. Well, here they were re-energized, they were refocused, and they were ready to go. And in verse 32, we see what they did as they left. This is another summary passage. And it says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said, that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Verse 34, there was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which also means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, a beautiful passage of unity. A good prayer. God, help us to achieve this. They were so unified that they said, I don't have anything that I own. What I have is for the betterment of God and for my people, right? That's what we started out with. My people, our tribe. Whatever I have is is to help you out. There was no one that had need. What's beautiful about this passage is that every socioeconomic level is seen in this passage. Now typically, at least the way I interpret it, because God has blessed me, is that that all the rich people said, hey, here you go, I'm giving up all I have for the betterment of whoever. No, everyone was a participant here. Whether you were the rich person that had a a house and land, or whether you were the, the widow that gave its last penny, they all gave what they had, they all had dignity, they all had purpose, they were all proclaiming God's word, they were all performing acts of service and care, which was unheard of in this Hellenistic culture. Because you know who shared with who? The rich people just shared with the rich people. You didn't, you didn't mess with those poor people. They're different. They have different beliefs. If God wanted them to be rich, they would be rich. So they didn't help each other. The early church did. Now, again, this isn't indicative for everybody now that is thinking of all of the things they own and like, oh gosh... What is a pastor going to say? I know we have a business meeting coming up in a couple of months, and we have a big budget that we need to cover. Should we just sell everything we have and just give it and lay it here at the council's feet and say, hey, do with it as you wish? That's up to you. I'll let Gary handle that conversation. But what it's saying is that because they were so bold, because they trusted everything in God, it was okay to do it. They knew that each other, they had each other's back. If I was going to sell my house, they knew that someone else would give them a house, a place to stay. If they sold all their food, they knew that they would have food by the other members of their community. Could you imagine being in a community like that? Sometimes we do. We call it family. Right now, my kids, they have everything in common. 
They share all of my, my income, my food, my house, my cars, my gas. We share everything together. Now, what if we did that? Share our needs, and we, we would trust each other like that. That's hard. Why is it hard? Because I've been burnt in the past. I've had people that I've trusted, and they've burnt me. I've given them some gifts that they were going to pay back. They didn't. And so you know what that makes me for the next person? Hesitant to be that generous. So all that sin that's done against us, we, we accumulate that. But what do we do with all that frustration and pain and hurt? Do we give it back to God, or do we let it seethe inside of us so we, we take it out on the next person? So how do we get the same unity they did in the early church? One, we have to recognize who's in charge. It's God. He created everything. He gave us everything. Everything that we own is God's, whether we like it or not. One day, we will be buried, and our stuff is going to go to our kids, maybe for a while, until they pass on. At some point, it's probably going to end up in the landfill, but it's all God's. So I need to decide how I'm going to honor and glorify God with what he has given me. Second, we need to sacrifice our own wants, our own needs, our own desires for God and the greater good. For as we care for our community, that's our internal community and also our external community around us. The, those people that are around us that need to know about God and that there are people that care and want to know them. God is providing us to be in their lives for reasons. What is that? It could be monetary support. It could be emotional support. It could be spiritual support. How is God calling you to engage? Are you being bold like the early church? Are we proclaiming word and work? Does our walk meet our talk at the end of the day? And if we do these things, if we trust God and we trust one another, we can start that same unity we have concerns and we can share them in a place where we're not going to be judged and there's going to be trust and it's going to be built and we can share our concerns we can have pushback and it can be beautiful and so that will continue to help galvanize us can help mold us together into a church that is known for how we love God and how we love others may we be that type of church to boldly proclaim God's word and boldly love and care for those around us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much how you are calling us to think about others more important than ourselves. God, how you are called us and given us all of these things, not for our own comfort, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of you and for the benefit of those around us. How can we boldly use the things that you have given us for your glory? Father, who today, who today needs encouragement? Who can I talk to to say I'm here for them, that I care about them, that they are not alone? Father, I pray that we would share our time, our talent, and our treasure, that they would all be for your glory. Father, we pray that you would help us all be as bold as those in the early church. Father, that their, their prayer of boldness would be our prayer. And Father, may we be shaken to our core, just as they were as they prayed. Father, I pray that you would all help us all leave changed this morning, trusting you more, loving you more, and trusting and loving each other more. We pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. morning, we are also going to celebrate the Lord's su Supper together. And what a good morning to, to share the Lord's Supper, because this is a meal that is bringing us together. This is a family meal. This is a meal that is showing our unity. 
just as many of us are going to gather this weekend to celebrate Independence Day, to celebrate our national birthday, our holiday as a birthday, in the same way we gather and celebrate our nation, we also use this moment every month to celebrate our unity as a church, as a church family, that we come together proclaiming that we are going to be and enjoy a feast one day in heaven together, not just with one another, but with the entire history of the church. That we get to have a meal together with Jesus, with Peter, with John, that we can ask them about the day that the, this earthquake happened. And so when we come to this table, we come as sinners needing a Savior. And so together, we will recite a corporate confession. So if you take out your bulletin, the corporate confession is there on your bulletin. And I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and get ready. And as they, the ushers are getting ready, I'm going to have us go ahead and read this corporate confession of sin. It says this, Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us and let your word abide with us until it has wrought in us your holy will. Amen. Ushers, would you mind coming forward? So friends, as we distribute our communion caps as this morning, I want to encourage that as you receive them, take a moment and ponder that confession. You all have it written there before you. Consider what we have confessed. At, in a moment, as the ushers come back forward, we will have a time of an assurance of pardon and then the words of institution. So just take a moment and ponder the goodness that God has poured out upon you.
although we come to this table as sinners in need of a Savior, we remember what Christ has done on our behalf. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread and after giving thanks, He broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, He took the cup and He poured it out, saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink this cup and, and eat from this bread, you proclaim my death when until I return. And so we receive this assurance of pardon. If you take out your bulletin again, we read this together because as we eat and drink of this cup, we proclaim Jesus' death and we receive our assurance of pardon. And it says this, Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself our people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Amen. When you're ready, eat and drink. For those that can stand, please be willing to stand as we sing and conclude with 343 Amazing Grace found in your hymnal. We'll sing just verses 1, 2, and 4. Notice also it's kind of at the bottom of the page. It carries over, so it kind of can uh, be hidden a little bit. So 343 Amazing Grace, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Again, it's been a blessing to meet with you this morning, whether it's here in person or at home. We're so gl glad that you could join us. Uh, we hope everyone has a safe holiday weekend. Um, and next week, make sure it's on your calendar for our VBS debrief uh, in the library. Uh, but feel free to join us downstairs in the Fellowship Hall for some uh, coffee and donuts this morning. Today, our benediction is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16, and it says this. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Go in grace and peace this morning. Mm -hmm.